Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Uh, today we are going to be talking about stars. This is called Introduction to Stars. Um, so in today's lesson, what we're primarily going to be looking at is uh, just some properties of stars. We'll start with the sun, um, look at some of the basic properties, a uh, little we'll quick how do we know what we know kind of thing. Um, then we'll talk about the motion of stars, both in our sky and then um, out in the universe. We'll talk about stellar distances and how those are measured, um, and then some properties of stars. Um, primarily temperature, uh, brightness, and size. And we'll look at how all those stars are categorized and classified based on those characteristics. So let's get right to it. Oh, as, as before, if you see something with a blue, um, a blue outline, it means it's linked to another site. And uh, if you like, if you have time, you can go and look through that. But again, be careful, watch out for rabbit holes. All right, here we go. So we'll start with Edwin Powell Hubble. Um, you probably recognize the name from the uh, famous Hubble telescope. Um, but Edwin Hubble was an astronomer uh, in the early, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and the quote that I'm sharing here is, equipped with his five senses, man explores the universe around him and calls the adventure science. So uh, over on the left-hand side, you'll see a picture of the famous Hubble Space Telescope. So let's start with the sun. Um, our sun, of course, is you know very large, very bright. Um, we think of it as large anyway, but as it turns out, it's actually pretty mediocre uh, when compared to other stars. But how do we know about our sun? How do we know how the sun operates? It's not like we can go inside of it and uh, you know kind of dig around and see what's going on in there. So how do we how do we know? Um, and so there's a few different ways. And the first one is, of course, observations in different wavelengths of light. If you remember back to physical science, you have radio, microwave, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma ray. Looking at the sun through each of those different wavelengths of light gives you a different picture about what's going on, um, a different view of the sun. And so by using that and by studying the material that streams out of the sun, um, for example, charged particles, um, high, fast-moving, uh, tiny little atomic nuclei, energy, um, wavelengths of light, uh, these weird, strange particles called neutrinos. Um, all those are different ways that we can study our sun. And then the last one that I have here is something called helioseismology. So if you break that word down, helio meaning sun, um, seismology like is an earthquake. So it turns out the, the, uh, the sun, is constantly rippling. Um, it's almost like sound waves that are traveling through the sun. And by studying those, we can kind of get a, a good glimpse about how the sun operates. And it's just like anything else in science. You know, we we um, start with a theory and uh, for an explanation for something in the sun, like for how it operates. And then based on that theory, we uh, make predictions about what we should find. And uh, that's what we found. We found that the sun is a large, very massive object that is undergoing nuclear fusion at its core, um, fusing hydrogen nuclei into helium. Um, and that process gives off a lot of different things, including neutrinos, and uh, we can track those and measure those, and uh, turns out that's exactly what's happening inside the interior of our sun. It is fusing hydrogen into helium um, at an extremely fast rate. Uh, it's almost like an explosion. The sun is trying to blow itself apart. Fusion is a huge, powerful reaction. But at the same time, gravity is pushing down on it. So that that explosion is contained and it just kind of sits there. So um, the pictures that you see here, the uh, this first one uh, over here on the right hand side is our sun, but in different wavelengths of light. Um, same with this picture here. You can see these cutaway sections are in different wavelengths of light. Um, and this last one over here is actually the sun superimposed onto um, a disk that covers up the sun by a, a solar observatory in outer space so we can see the charged particles kind of flying out. So I have a couple of different things that you can click here. Um, the first one here is just looking at how we detect oops, some of those charged particles. This is a neutrino observatory. So it's, um, or, sorry, this is looking at the charged particles from space uh, sideways. So you can see the material flying out. And that's the sun over here on the left-hand side. All 
All right. Here's the neutrino observatory. It's actually located underground. So those neutrinos don't interact with matter very much. And so to collect neutrinos, it has to be very deep underground and they interact uh, with usually water, um, heavy water. It's uh, H2O, but the hydrogen has an extra neutron. And so sometimes those neutrinos will interact and flash off that neutron and it'll give off a tiny bit of light. And that's picked up by all of these bulbs that you see here. And then the last one, helioseismology, uh, again, is the study of the sun um, by listening to it. <laughs> Astronomers listen to the sun's heartbeat to learn about the inside of the sun, just like seismologists learn about the interior of the earth by listening to earthquakes. All right, so some other ways that we know about our sun, of course, is looking at the sun through different wavelengths of light. Um, looking at different wavelengths of light allow us to identify all these different parts here. So we have the chromosphere, the colored part, um, sunspots, which are slightly cooler areas of the sun. The photosphere is actually the part that gives off light, photo light. Uh, the corona, that's the stream of charged particles flying out of the sun. And on the inside, of course, we have the core. That's where fusion is actually occurring. That energy is radiated, radiated out through the radiative zone. Um, and then we also have the convection zone. So that material is convected out um, into outer space. And then we have some other really cool features such as a coronal hole, um, which is a hole in the corona, uh, cooler areas produced by different activities on the sun um, through magnetic uh, field interactions, really neat. So I have a cool website here where you get to kind of play like you are um, a solar astronomer looking at features of the sun through different wavelengths of light. Now, I'm not asking that you go through the entire thing, but there are a few things that I would like for you to look at. You can go through them pretty quick. So I'll show you, we'll skip the intro. All right, so here are three different ways that we study the sun. One's called SORCE, S-O-R-C-E, the Solar Radiation and Climate Experiment. You can see it's a, um, a satellite that is constantly pointed towards the sun, along with the solar and heliospheric observatory. And then the last one, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. So all of these are collecting information, gathering data about the sun. And again, using different wavelengths of light. So for example, in X-ray, you can see some of the really hot, hot features. In um, extreme ultraviolet, in uh, medium wavelength ultraviolet, uh, here's the violet part of the spectrum, not ultraviolet, but the purple side, the violet. Uh, let's see, this is the visible part of the spectrum. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Also in the visible band. And here we have an infrared view and finally a microwave view. So all of those are giving you glimpses into different features. I'm gonna fast forward through this. All right. So looking uh, in visible light, we can see the photosphere, the surface of the sun, the chromosphere, the colored part. It's a thin layer just above the photosphere. Let's skip down to the corona. And we can see that in extreme ultraviolet. And then finally, the solar wind. All right, so by, again, looking through all of these different wavelengths of light, we can see different things. So coronal holes, see the magnetic structure. Um, invisible light, we can see sunspots, cooler areas. Uh, we can see all of those there. In ultraviolet light, these huge things called prominences, which blow off out of the sun and then come back in, but also plagues, which are brighter areas, very hot. Solar flares, short-lived intense storms, 
create x-rays and shoot out fast moving particles into space. So again, it's by looking at these different wavelengths, we're able to see not only what's going on on the surface, but make predictions, create theories for how the sun actually operates. So let's talk about stellar motion. How do stars move? So there's two ways that we can talk about this. One is the actual motion of the star. Um, and then the other is the apparent motion of the star. So let's start with the actual motion. Stars rotate on an axis. They spin, they rotate, um, sometimes very, very fast. They also revolve around the center of a galaxy. Um, and then the last thing, you know, most stars are actually binaries or triple star systems. And some of them actually rotate and revolve around each other. So the pictures that you see here, of course, is a galaxy. Um, right here, you'll actually see stars orbiting the center of our Milky Way galaxy around an object that we can't see. Turns out to be a very, very massive black hole. And then this last one here is just looking at the motion of a binary star system. So we have one star here and the other star revolving around it. So the apparent motion of stars, this is what stars look like in our sky. So apparent motion, stars appear to move due to the Earth's rotation and revolution. So due to the Earth's rotation, all stars orbit around one central point, it's Polaris, the North Star. Um, the reason for that is because our axis is pointed towards Polaris. Um, our axis changes over the millennia, over geologic time. So right now, our axis is pointed towards Polaris. So all the stars seem to go around that. There are certain special stars called circumpolar, uh, which just go all the way around. Can't actually see those in the Southern Hemisphere. Stars also change their position um, due to Earth's revolution. So different points around the sun, we can see different stars. And this brings us to constellations. So what are constellations? Constellations are just groups of stars that appear close together and they form a pattern. Um, they are named usually after mythological figures, animals, everyday objects like ladles. Um, in ancient times, they're actually used as storytelling. Um, they were the entertainment. That was, that was the Netflix of the day. So uh, today we use them as roadmaps. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. If you click on this link, it'll take you to some online planetarium software, basically. Um, it's a really neat application, very easy to use. And you can set it up in, um, for anywhere on the planet and look at at any time of day where the stars are. But I want to show you the constellations very quickly. Here we go. So you can see the cardinal points there, northeast, southwest. I'm going to cut on the constellations. And their art. There we go. And just for fun, I'm going to point us towards the north and show you those circumpolar constellations. So here's Ursa Minor, right there is Polaris. Let's click this and just kind of go through the time by hour. Oops. Hey, whoops. All right, here we go. See how they all just seem to turn, uh, rotate around that point there or some minor. Anyway, lots of fun. Uh, lots of different views and things. You can search for things in the sky as well. So really neat software. Circumpolar constellations are just those constellations that you can see year round because uh, they circle the poles. And so there's about five or six of them, depending on where you are on the planet. But for most of us in the Northern Hemisphere, there are five main constellations that we can see. Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, Ursa Major, the Big Bear, including the Big Dipper, uh, Cassiopeia the Queen, Cepheus the King, um, right there, a little bit of Camel Lepartilus, Camel, and uh, Draco the Water Dragon, or Draco the Dragon. There's some seasonal constellations as well, and these are very related to the zodiac, but uh, seasonal constellations are only seen, sorry for the typo, during specific times of the year due to the position of the Earth in its, or, uh, in its revolution around the sun. So, uh, for example, we can see Orion in, you know, the winter months, but in the summer months, we don't see it. 
So how do we measure distance? Measuring distance in space is a very tricky thing. Um, it's not like we can get out there with a ruler um, or measuring tape or drive to the star and you know, walk to it or whatever you, you can think of to try to figure out distance. So how do astronomers find the distance to stars? And there's different methods. So we're gonna start with the method um, that can tell us the close stars and their distance. Um, so the first one I'm gonna to talk to you about is something called parallax. Now parallax is a method of determining distance to a star based on the shift in apparent positions of the star viewed from different angles. Um, how, so how do we view a star from a different angle? Well, we just wait six months. Take a picture of a star in let's say January, take it a picture again in July and it will have, if it's close enough, it will have changed positions just slightly. We can use that change in positions um, to determine the distance. Again, some method called parallax. And it's something you're actually very familiar with. Easy, hold your thumb out, close one eye, look at your thumb, keep it steady, then flip to the other eye, back and forth. And you'll see that your thumb changes position. So our brains actually use parallax to determine distance based on the two different images from here and here. It's just like uh, how we use parallax to see um, stars. We can look at it in June versus December um, and look at that apparent shift in position. Here's another trick. If you do it close, you'll see it's a very large parallax. But for things that are really far away, it's a very small parallax. So parallax, um, and you can see kind of the shift in the star's position here in this little um, bottom GIF, I call them GIFs. Um, but over a six months period, observers will note where the star is located. And based on that little tiny little change and just a little bit of right triangle math, basically, Pythagorean theorem, we can work out the distance to the star. But here's the problem. It only works for stars that are about 326 light years away, which is actually not very far, um, or 100 parsecs. I'll talk about a parsec in just a minute. Um, they have to be kind of close. They get too far away. It's too small of a change to be able to measure, um, and so we can't work out distance. So this method really only works for kind of close stars, our nearby neighborhood. So I, I said something about a parsec, and you've probably heard something about a light year. So I want to talk about distances. We measure distance to stars in different units. Um, one of them, of course, you're kind of familiar with astronomical units. That's a little bit too small to measure distances. So we use the term light year. A light year is the distance that light travels in one year. You can do the math. If light travels at a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second, all right, how far does that light beam travel in one year? 300,000 times that's per second times 60 seconds in a minute times 60 minutes in an hour times 24 hours in a day times 365 days in a year. Works out to be about 9.5 trillion kilometers in one year. So it's a big number. Let's just make it easy, equal to one light year. Just to give you some comparison, the sun is eight light minutes away from the earth. Um, that means that light takes eight minutes to reach us from the sun to here. This also brings about a very interesting idea as far as time. We don't see things as they are. We see things as they were. The closer they are, the more close to the present we see them. So if I were looking at you in a classroom, light takes a fraction of 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 a second to bounce off of you into my eyes. So I'm not seeing you as you are then. I'm seeing you as you were a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second ago. The most distant objects we can see with telescopes are things that are 13 billion light years away. B with a billion. That means that we're seeing that object as it was 13 billion years ago. A little bit of uh, noodle frying. I love that. I love that we're actually looking back in time anytime we see something. So some other distances, um, approximately how far. Earth is about 8.3 light minutes from the sun. We're 320 light years from the North Star Polaris. 4.3, 4.2 light years away from our closest star called Cent uh, Proxima Centauri. 
26,000 light years from the center of our galaxy, 2.5 million light years to our nearest galaxy, our nearest neighboring galaxy called Andromeda. Um, and again, 13.4 billion light years away from one of the oldest galaxies ever found. So we're seeing it as it was 13.4 billion years ago. So here are some measurement distances um, that you should be familiar with. Of course, astronomical unit is the distance from the average distance from the Earth to the sun. This is in order of uh, increasing light year, the distance light travels in one year. And then something called a parsec. A parsec is based on parallax. Um, it's based on an angle of measurement. Uh, Remember, going around a circle 360 degrees, um, you can divide those degrees into minutes and divide those degrees into seconds. So a light year, uh, excuse me, a parsec is equal to 3.26 light years. So, so slightly larger. Remember Star Wars made the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs? Sorry, that's wrong. Parsec is a distance, not a time. Sorry, Han. All right, let's talk about, we talked about motion, um, we talked about the sun, we talked about distance. Now let's talk about some of the characteristics of stars and how we organize them and classify them. Let's we'll start with magnitude. So magnitude means basically brightness. So we can measure the brightness of a star, but how do we do that? Because stars in our sky look a little different than if we were right up on them. So the visibility of a star actually depends on two things, the actual brightness of that star, like how much light is it actually giving off, and the distance from the Earth. So we measure um, brightness using two different scales. Um, apparent magnitude, is, and that's how it looks to us here on the Earth, and then absolute magnitude, how bright is it actually? Let's start with apparent magnitude. So apparent magnitude refers to, again, how bright is a star in our sky? It's an inverse uh, scale, so that the lower the number, the brighter. So you can see in the little graphic here, um, the sun is about 20, has a stellar magnitude, apparent magnitude of about 27, uh, negative 27. So the lower the number, the brighter. Um, Polaris is at about a one, that's the North Star, it's not very, not extremely bright. Um, Sirius, Sirius, the uh, brightest star in our sky is actually just like a negative one, negative two. Um, the planet Venus is about a negative four, full moon is about a negative 12. Our eyes can see up to a limit of about a six. So again, the lower the number, the brighter. But absolute magnitude is the actual brightness of a star. It's actually, the definition of absolute magnitude is the brightness of a star if it were viewed at 32.6 light years away from the Earth, or 10 parsecs. Again, the lower the number, the brighter, and absolute magnitude ranges typically from about negative 5, it's very bright, to about plus 15, very, very dim. The sun, as comparison, has a, uh, an absolute magnitude of positive 5. So the sun turns out really kind of wimpy, honestly. So absolute versus apparent magnitude. Let me talk just a little bit more about this, and this will make perfect sense. Let's imagine you got a very weak flashlight with an old-fashioned bulb, and a very super strong floodlight with an LED bulb, very, very bright. So absolute magnitude of the old flashlight is going to be very, um, it's going to be a very low uh, magnitude. Um, the absolute magnitude of the floodlight is going to be very big. But could you make them look the same to your eyes? And absolutely, it just depends on the distance. Um, so here's some analogies for you. Cars A and car B are identical, but car A will appear brighter because it's closer. Um, cars A and cars B are the same distance, but A's headlights appear brighter because they are actually brighter. Their absolute magnitude is brighter. So. We can have a really, really dim star that's very close to us and appear very bright to our, to our eyes, apparent magnitude very high. Um, or we could have a very, very bright star, but it's very, very far away. Um, so absolute versus apparent. Absolute magnitude is actually a better measure because it's an actual 
comparison of energy. Whereas a parent is really just looking at the distance and the brightness. So how else can we measure stars? Well, temperature. The temperature of the star is related to its color. Um, and it's just like the electromagnetic spectrum. Red is the lowest energy color, whereas purple is the highest energy color. So stars typically have a range of temperature on the surface, just the surface. The cores are millions of degrees. But on the surface, most stars have a temperature range of about 27, 2800 degrees Celsius to about 24,000 degrees Celsius. Blue stars are the hottest. Some can be as hot as 50,000 degrees on the surface. Um, but blues are the hottest, reds are the coolest, and they can be around 2,800, 3,000 degrees Celsius. Our sun, as comparison, again, kind of wimpy, is a typical yellow average star with a temperature of about 6,000 degrees. So if we're talking about color, red, yellow, blue, it's basically it, cool, medium, hot. I did skip some colors in there, didn't I? So I have a couple of videos for you if you're interested. The first one is called Brown Dwarfs. Brown Dwarfs are failed stars. Uh, they're stars that didn't have enough mass in the nebula to start the fusion process. And so they're, they're really like really big Jupiters, basically. Um, and then the other one is why there are no green stars. And it turns out it's actually an effect of our eyes and how our eyes evolved to see light um, based on our uh, cone cells, uh, red, blues, and green. So anyway, very interesting uh, couple of videos there for you. All right, how do we classify these stars? So we've talked about brightness, we've talked about temperature and color. If you take a sample of as many stars as you can, and you start to classify them based on temperature and brightness, you'll start to see a pattern, a pretty good pattern. Um, and so that's what the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is doing. And you're gonna be very familiar with this, hopefully. The Hertzsprung-Russell diagram shows that pattern between absolute magnitude and the surface temperature of the star. Basically, the brightness of stars will increase as temperature increases. So in this graph, let's look at uh, the y-axis. Here we have absolute magnitude. Remember, the bigger the number, the dimmer. The lower the number in the negatives, the brighter. And across the top, you'll see the temperature. Now, the temperature is set up um, really hot over here on the x-axis to very low. And you can kind of see the color go from blue to yellow to red. Here's our sun. Again, medium brightness medium temperature, kind of on the smaller side. Smaller side. You'll also see over here this, a, same, a similar scale. This is luminosity, um, also measuring brightness, but in more empirical units. And then spectral class, which is uh, just a classification of stars based on their temperature. Um, so you can see it's weird numbers, um, weird letters, sequences, O, B, A, F, G, K, um, M, and there's the L after that, but um, some of those don't show up. But most stars will occur along this line right here called main sequence, 95% of them. Oops. Um, sorry, there is a little animation that you can play with there. Um, most stars, 95% of all stars occur on that line. Some of the other stars that you'll see, uh, the 5% supergiants, giants, and white dwarfs. And we'll talk more of those, more about those when we get into stellar evolution tomorrow. All right, so a little bit more about the HR diagram. And there's a nice video up there for you. Um, the main sequence, again, that's where 95% of stars are, right there. Um, these stars are burning hydrogen into helium in their core. The red ones are doing it very slowly. These blue ones up here, very fast, they're the race cars. They live fast and die hard. Um, so it goes from that cool red to the hot blue. So again, the x-axis 
corresponds to temperature, and you can see it's an inverse, so it starts high and goes low. The y-axis goes from dim to bright. Again, main sequence stars, 95% of them are burning hydrogen into helium, fusing hydrogen into helium in the core. Oops. The other parts, white dwarfs, supergiants and giants are at the end or near the end of their life cycle. So they are no longer burning hydrogen into helium. Something else is happening there. And again, we'll talk about that more tomorrow. So what determines that life cycle? Um, so we've looked at the magnitude of the star or the brightness, the temperature. What determines where they fall on that main sequence line and what determines what kind of life they will have and what they will end up as? Will they end up as a white dwarf, a giant to a white dwarf, or will they end up as um, a supergiant to a neutron star or a supergiant to a black hole? And the answer is actually quite simple. It's the mass. It's the mass of the star. How big is it? Um, think of the mass of the star like an engine. Um, red, cool, small stars are like little Priuses. They can go for a long time burning, just chugging away. But those blue ones, huge mass, massive. If you saw the scale uh, video of stars that I showed you after the METOC test, you'll understand that some stars are incredibly massive, 20, 30 times the mass of our sun. Those stars can burn through their nuclear fuel like a race car, like these huge engine race cars. They burn through it so fast and they live fast and then they die hard. They go super giant to supernova, um, leaving behind a neutron star or even a black hole. So lots of interesting things here. I've got quite a few links if you'd like to take a look but it all has to do with mass. Again, last thing, how do we know what we know? Um, how do we study stars? How do we know that it's burning hydrogen into helium? And that comes down to its light. So light, of course, can give us lots of information. Scientists use things called spectroscopes. And spectroscopes are actually just prisms. So they can hook a spectroscope up to a telescope, allow the light from the star to come into it. Um, that prism will break that uh, light up into its component colors. However, when you see the spectrum of a star that's really finely detailed, you can see that there's some missing portions. This is actually the, uh, over here on the bottom right, it's actually the spectrum of the sun. And you can see all of these dark areas. So what are those dark areas? So as we pull in light from a star, we can look at it and evaluate it in different wavelengths of light to kind of determine its temperature. So looking at how much light is being put out in different parts of the spectrum allows us to see temperature. But then the prism of that light can tell us what's actually burning on the inside. One of my favorite uh, little experiments, demonstrations when I was studying chemistry in college was we would take um, a little metal rod and dip it into an element um, and then take that element, stick it on a Bunsen burner, fire, flame, and it would go and burn a certain color. You know this from fireworks. Fireworks have different elements added to the uh, gunpowder or the powder so that when it burns, it burns a certain color. So different elements burn different colors. So stars, as it's burning through its um, hydrogen, fusing hydrogen into helium, it sends out light that shines through the entire star. Once that light leaves the star, it carries with it information about what was on the inside. And so we analyze those spectra to determine exactly what's going on inside of it. So here are three different types of spectrums. One is a continuous spectrum, very typical. You can get that with any prism, but these other two, the emission spectrum and the absorption spectrum. The bright line or emission spectrum depend on the element that it's shining through. And the dark line or absorption spectrum, when the wavelengths pass through a cool gas, some are absorbed in the same characteristic pattern. See, both of these are actually pointing to the element hydrogen. This is the emission spectrum when that hydrogen burns. This is that the absorption spectrum as the light passes through cool hydrogen. And you can see they're just basically inverses. 
So scientists use those absorption spectrum to determine the composition of the star, what's inside of it, and the temperature. So stars are made up of all the elements, um, all these different elements, um, and each one has a unique spectrum. And you can see all the way down from aluminum, argon, calcium, there's hydrogen, helium, all the way to xenon. Turns out stars are mainly hydrogen and helium, two most plentiful elements in the universe, two most simple elements of the universe. But stars are also made out of other elements, including carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and calcium. All right. It's really interesting to me that stars create elements. Um, they fuse elements. Um, what, and I'll just give you a, the quick story and I'll stop. Um, before I was a teacher, um, I remember getting, uh, I think it was right out of college, I got the big cable package. Um, you know, that was a big deal. I get to see whatever I want. And I remember it was late one night, I was flipping through some channels and I came to, I heard a voice and the voice reminded me of my childhood. It was actually um, Captain Kirk uh, from Star Trek. And he was actually doing a documentary and it was about stars. And the thing that captured my attention was <clears throat> when he said, stars create matter. They create the elements of the universe. What you're gonna find out in the next couple of classes is that hydrogen and helium were the primary elements of the universe, but that those hydrogen and helium elements combined to make the first stars. Inside of the cores of those stars, that hydrogen was fusing into helium, and then it would fuse hydrogen and helium into other elements. In the most massive stars, you can actually fuse all the way up to number 26 on the periodic table in the core of that star. Number 26 is iron. Iron is a very special element because it cannot be created inside of this gravitational pressurized crucible of a star. Something else has to happen to make all the other elements. So once the star hits that hydrogen, oh, excuse me, hits that iron, fusion stops. And so remember, like I said, fusion is an explosion trying to blow it up. Gravity is a force trying to crunch it down. Once fusion stops, gravity wins and it crunches and it explodes back out. That explosion takes all those other elements, the, the hydrogen all the way up to iron, and then fuses them with other elements to make everything after number 26 on the periodic table. So the point of the story is stars created us. All the elements that are inside of us, all the elements that make everything around us was formed in a star. We are literally stardust. So um, for me, it's important to understand where we came from, and this is how we do it. All right, so I've talked a lot. I know I've gone through a lot of material. I appreciate your attention. If you have any questions or want to talk about any of this stuff, please let me know. I would uh, be more than happy to do so. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you soon.